So this is the first module, computer abstraction. Um, in the first slide of every module, I put the uh, resources I use to create that slide, that PowerPoint. Um, so you can easily see what chapter of which book to use for that. Uh, not that you need to read the book, but it's just for your information, so you can go and check and see uh, what is also included in the book. Obviously, uh, I just choose things that I believe is good for the class, and it's actually enough for the class, uh, but if you want to do some self-study, this is the uh, references. This is actually good practice anyways, in academia at least, and also in industry, to uh, mention your sources whenever you're actually using someone else's material. So if you're using this book, and I also am using some of the slides from uh, my advisor at UCF. So I change them, of course, but some of the slides are uh, adopted from his material. So Ronald DeMar is uh, the guy who used, I use some of his slides. All right, so this is officially the first technical session of the course. And I want to quickly go over the course objectives one more time. Um, obviously, the first objective of the course is uh, getting some knowledge about what happens at the hardware level when you run your program. So you have a high-level language program like C, and a lot of you have worked with these types of programs, but in this class we're going to learn what is actually happening behind the scene. It matters because if you want to do optimization, you have to know what is happening there. And also a lot of errors you get when you're actually running your code uh, can be understood a little bit better if you have this knowledge. So not only you can design better codes, but also you can identify some of the problems that you have in your code if you just care about the uh, software implementation. But if you do care about the hardware side, it's actually a good start for you to learn how the processor works. So that brings us to the second objective, which is how we actually build a CPU, a central processing unit. So this is the part that I'm excited to do in the class, but this is also the challenging part, which is because we need to learn a new programming language and some new programs, some new software, uh, which should be fine. I am going to have some meetings this week with my um, graduate assistants in the lab and see if we can have some kind of you know, one hour sessions every week. Uh, so if you're interested, you can either come to the lab or maybe I just book in the book class so you can they can teach you how to program the system very well and obviously that that's going to be optional you don't have to go there but that can help that is something that we didn't have that semester last year actually and it was a little bit hard for students to learn that uh, but if we do at the end if we do learn system very well at the end of the class, hopefully we can actually build a CPU together. Um, there's another course that does something very similar. It's advanced digital design. Not a lot of you actually need to take it. They work on ARM processor, RISC-V processors, taught by Dr. Jason Bakers. Uh, so you get ready for that course. But also, the way we look at the design of the computer, uh, the CPU, is different from that course because we actually talk about the digital design. We are focusing on computer architecture. So we're not going to be worried about the VLSI design and all those stuff, the transistor level synthesis. Uh, we just do simulation. So we never actually go to the hardware implementation, but you do get some idea about the computer architecture itself. That's the way I learned it, computer architecture. That's the way it is taught at Stanford, MIT, Berkeley. So. I know it's going to be a little bit difficult, but we, we try doing that because why not, right? It's a little bit difficult, but we never know until we push ourselves. 
So we just try that. If it doesn't work, as I said, I'm very flexible. So in the middle of the class, I can just change the project somehow if you see it's not really working for you. But I really want to try that because that actually changed my life, literally, because I took that course and it changed the direction of at my career because I really loved computer architecture, although I didn't do well in that course. Uh, but it didn't matter that much. So constructing a CPU is something that is very exciting. Actually, it can go to your resume and you know, they actually implement the next processor. That's a nice thing to have. Now we talk about the third objective, which is how we want to evaluate a processor. So we can have different metrics like performance, execution time, uh, energy, power consumption. Uh, so a big part of this course is on quantitative analysis of the processors. It's literally the name of the book, which is the main reference of uh, this course, or supposed to be the main reference of this course. So quantitative analysis is an important thing that you're going to learn here. We're going to talk about different metrics, different programs, how we can get those metrics, why it matters, and hopefully how we can optimize that. So this is an important thing because in real world, especially if you're doing an advanced state-of-the-art job, they just don't, as I mentioned, they don't care about the function, just, just they do care about the functionality of the code, of course, but that's a bare minimum. Almost every design has some requirements. And they just think, okay, this is the power budget that you have. This is the performance budget that you have. We're working with companies that they ask us to just focus on latency, for example. Just focus on throughput. So we learn what the throughput is, what the latency is, what the power consumption is, and how we can optimize those in this class as well. One of the most important things to learn as a computer architect is how processor and memory work. So there are two important blocks, processor that actually does the computation and memory, which is where we store and load data to and from. Right? These are the two blocks that we focus on. In the intro to computer architecture course, we never get to memory. So one of the biggest things in the computer architecture class is actually learning about how memory works, and again, how we can do optimizations, what are the different types of memories, and so on. And I think this is the last one, but yeah, so we want to understand the basic components in a computer system. For example, what is an ALU? What is a register file, right? Uh, these different blocks, how do they work? Uh, these are the things that we're going to cover in the class and we want to work with. So if you actually learn system very well, not only you learn how to use register file, but also you design a register file. Not only you use an ALU, but also you design an ALU. Of course, we provide the code for you, but at least you need to know how to run the code, how to optimize it, and so on. As I said, because this is the first module, I'm going to uh, ask for my acknowledgement to the materials that I use. So we have uh, the Hennessy and Patterson uh, Computer Architecture and Quantitative Approach Book. It's a fifth edition, there are newer editions, of course. This is the edition that you can find online for free. Um, we have the Patterson and Hennessy book, the same guys, borders different. Computer Organization and Design, the Hardware Software Interface, that's another book. Then we have the Harris and Harris book, which is Digital Design and Computer Architecture. So this is, uh, traditionally, this is supposed to be the book for computer architecture. This is supposed to be a book for the intro to computer architecture. And this is the book for advanced digital design. But I use materials from all of them because I think it helps. And hopefully you can appreciate that as well when you move forward. Obviously, as I said, I use some of the slides, probably 10, 20% of the slides that I use is uh, from my advisor, my PhD advisor back at UCF. And obviously I use internet sources like photos, things, and so on. Okay. Any questions?
questions before moving forward? Good. All right, so the processor that we're going to focus on in this course is called MIPS. How many of you guys have heard about MIPS? So MIPS processor is a very simple processor, but actually very useful, right? One of the reasons that we use MIPS is because it's, it's a real processor. It's not just something that is used in academia. It's that it does have real world applications, but it's also easy enough, easy to understand within a semester, right? So where are MIPS processor used these days? We have uh, them in Cisco routers. We actually do have them there. A lot of Android devices use MIPS processors. We have TVs, cable boxes using them. Uh, portable PlayStation uh, use them. So they are actually used. The MIPS 32 processor that we're teaching the course is literally being used in many devices these days. Embedded systems, targeted for embedded systems, IoT devices, so it does have a real application, but fortunately it's simple enough so you can learn, hopefully learn it within a sense. Emphasize of MIPS is on simplicity, so it's not very complicated. The instruction set architecture is pretty straightforward. Uh, as again, we can learn that within a semester, hopefully. If you understand MIPS, you have a pretty good idea about the ARM processors. ARM processors like RISC series, RISC V, for example, is a very famous uh, processor which is actually taught in the advanced digital design. Uh, it's an ARM processor, but it's entirely based on MIPS. So if you learn how MIPS works, you have a pretty good idea about a lot of ARM processors. And ARM processors are used in many places, like literally I think a lot of you know, cell phones that we have, I don't want to put it, because I'm not sure, I don't want to say some percentage, but they actually use ARM processors. A lot of Samsung and all these technologies they use ARM processors. If you know MIPS, you have a pretty good idea about ARM processors, which is nice. It's an open architecture, everything is available. The instruction set architecture, the entire design is available. It's actually started from academia, so we have access to every information about this processor, and we can add things to it. So that's what I'm hoping to get in the class, because probably we're going to give you the MIPS processor, the system very log code for a MIPS processor. So one of your projects is going to be, okay, this is the processor, just run it. Right? And then from there, we can start adding things to it. Right? So everything is available. The architecture is open source. You can do everything you want to do with it. You can enhance the architecture and so on. And as I said, MIPS processor is designed for IoT, small devices, devices, edge computing, and so on. It's actually very useful, and you know there's a big market for these gadget these days and if you actually into maybe having a startup why not you can have some understanding about this systems and then you can deploy your program on it right so this is do you have a question yeah um so can you talk a little more, more about how um mips and arm are related to each other because i think i've heard some some things that have confused me, um, like, is um, are all MIPS instructions like a a hard subset of ARM instructions, or are there actually set, um, sections of them that are distinctly different? So you can't really say that they. So there is a part of the class that we focus on instructions and architecture and how what type of instructions we have. We get to that part. But you can't easily say that, for example, MIPS instruction is a subset of ARM instructions because they have different types of instructions. But the idea here is that we have a pipeline processor. It has an ALU. It has a memory. This is how it works. This, if you know pipelining, you understand the pipeline and there is pipe processors. And also, if you understand instructions as architecture in general, when you go to ARM, you say, okay, this is a flexible instruction architecture. For example, MIPS has fixed 32-bit instructions, 
arm is flexible, but it's not something crazy. You know, you just, if you learn the basic, you can understand those uh, small changes in our arm. But, but when there are different processes that are not open source, that are entirely different. So it's not just the structures and architectures, the entire processor, the way they do pipeline and everything is very different. But arm and lifts are not like that. There are small things that are different, but it's easy for you to understand those as well. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this module is called uh, design abstraction or processor abstraction, I already forgot. Uh, but let's talk about design abstraction. So design abstraction is, maybe we can say a method, a technique that we use as designers to communicate in different levels of in software, hardware, stack, right? So you pretty much simplify things, not too much that we lose important details, but we make it simple enough so I as a computer architect can talk to someone of the software developer. We do understand the system in general, but we don't go into details of the implementation. So what we're gonna do today is gonna learn high level knowledge about computer architecture. This is what is called design abstraction. So here you can see uh, something that is usually called hardware software stack. We have hardware at the lower levels of design, and then we go up, we have computer architecture, for example. Hardware is very general, so in a bit I'm gonna tell you that hardware also has its own stack. But let's say we have hardware, and then we have system level software. And then we have application level work. So, for example, if you have the experience of developing an app for your Apple phone, you don't even deal with software level. You're just using something at the application level. You're developing an application, you use it, and then there are compilers, assemblers, and everything going on to go from all the way up in the application level to the hardware level. Right? So this is what is called design abstraction. Hardware level usually is, implements very simple instructions, very low level instructions, right? As simple as add, multiplication, right? Some of them don't even have multiplication, but shifting left and right. Like these very simple instructions, but at the software level, you easily use the loop, more complex things, a nested loop or whatever, without caring what is actually happening at the hardware level. When it goes to that level, everything is very simple. So all those complications that you have in your code, somehow is translated to a very simple instruction. That's what hardware is. To talk a little bit about the hardware itself, hardware does have its levels too. There are levels that we're not gonna talk about in the class, I'm just gonna mention them now. Uh, just for you guys to know if you read it anywhere. So we have the device level of work. Device is those people who are working on transistors. How to optimize a transistor, how to create a new memory cell. Like we have DRAM, for example. But now, if you want to have a magnetic RAM, that's a device level of work. And then it goes lower too. It goes to material science, physics, and so on. Physics of the device, how you fabricate these devices, but these are all device work. Then we go to the circuit level of work, which is where we connect these transistors to create gates, for example. We have an AND gate, that is uh, or an AND gate, for example, that is uh, made by four transistors, two PMOS transistors, two NMOS transistors. So these are circuit level work. You create gates, and then you put together these gates, and you create a microarchitecture. It's a multiplier, it's an adder, it's something a little bit more complex, but still it's at the circuit level. At the computer architecture level is where you actually use these macro architectures to create an arithmetic or logic unit, right? So you don't really care what is inside the ALU you do, but how it is implemented, you don't care about it. The circuit designers care about it. How you design a very efficient adder is the concern for circuit level guys. Computer architectures care about the fact that there is an adder in the ALE, right? And how I want to use it to translate my high level 
programs to this lower level hardware. So hardware has its own layers to device, circuit, architecture. Here we're focusing on architecture, right? But to learn system very well, you need to know a little bit about the gate level design too, right? And this is the digital logic course. That's where that knowledge can help. And that's what we're hoping to provide to you, at, at least the basic knowledge about gate level design, so you can actually design a process. So as I said, there's a lot happening from application to hardware level. So we go from different intermediate representations, right, to get to the point that you actually run a code on hardware. So in simple words, let's say we have a high level language like C, we have a simple loop or if else condition, it doesn't matter, right? It's simple program. What the compiler does, and we actually have a course here, the compiler course. <coughs> compiler goes from high level language to a lower level language, like assembly. In this case, a mix assembly. Do so you see this code here? To convert this code to an assembly code, I have to know the instructions that this is what is called instruction set architecture. I need to have some knowledge about what instructions do I have at the assembly level. Like for example, JR, store word, this is a jump, loading something, storing something, adding, multiplication, and so on. So this is assembly, an example of a mixed assembly language, and that's what compiler does. Compiler goes from a high level language to a low level language with the knowledge about the instruction set architecture. This is, this is some sample of the instructions that you have in the instruction set architecture of that specific processor, right? Mix assembly language. Now we have assembler, and what assembler does is it goes from these instructions to binary machine codes. That's the language of the hardware. So hardware just understands ones and zeros, right? We have assembler that generates machine codes. If you were doing programming 50 years ago, you were the assembler, right? You had your program, you actually had cards of zeros and one, and then you just take your literally cards, you take them and you run your program, right? So you were the assembler. A good hardware architect can be the assembler, right? You, have, you don't have to do it in your everyday, in your job, no one does it now, but if you know it, you can be a different programmer. If you know it, you can be a different designer, right? There's a difference between someone that can finish a task and someone that is creative enough to develop a task. So you can be the guy who develops tasks for people because you have a knowledge about these different layers. The binary machine code. That's something that we're going to learn too. Hopefully, at some point, we're going to have a quiz that I give you some instructions, and then you give me the binary machine code for those instructions. It's going to be fun, right? So, having that knowledge about encoding, decoding. If I give you the machine code and you give me the instruction, both ways, it's actually very useful, right? To understand uh, how a process works. Because when you, when we actually get to the processor design, you can see that I have an instruction. This instruction is stored somewhere called instruction memory. And when I read this instruction from instruction memory, I get some machine code. Now, there's a part, is an encoder, pretty much, that gets these bits and sends it to different parts of the processor. Get the first five bits, go to ALU. The next six bits, go to somewhere else. So if you can do encoding and decoding, you can actually see how this is called a data flow architecture. You can see how your data flows from input to output. But what controls this system is these binary machine codes that you see here. These bits, every six bits, every five bits, every four bit, they matter. And they go to different places in the processor and they activate the path, which is called the data path. Right, so if you know the machine code, you can see how the data path works. You can see how we can go from input to output using these machine codes. Now it makes sense. We have machine codes controlling the processor. We have assembly language, which defines those 
machine code and we have a high level language which makes it simpler for a software developer to don't deal with a low level language. But having this knowledge can literally change how you program your code, how you design your programs because you know how it works at the low level, right? This is what we're gonna do in this class. Okay, now let's talk about the computer system. So there are five classic components for a computer system as you can see here. This is a computer system. You have the inputs coming from some type of sensor or a keyboard and so on. Then these inputs go to a system that has a memory and has a processor, right? Depending on what kind of input you have, you store it in the memory or you directly go to the processor. These are the things that are defined in the beta flow architecture, right? Uh, but what happens here is that at the CPU, at the, process, at the central processing unit, we have two main parts. We have the data path itself and we have the control. I just talked about it. So we have data path, which includes different blocks that actually do the computation. Right, but we already have we always have a lot of redundant blocks there. If you don't want to do multiplication, you're not going to use the multiplier there in the IOU, but it exists there, right? So you have to find a way to control the data flow and make sure that if you want to do the multiplication, you activate the part of the block that is part of the IOU, which is responsible for addition, not multiplication. Right, that's where it's called. We have the control flow. We have system con some control unit controlling the data flow, and then we have a data path which actually does the computation. These two together is a CPU. A processor has both control and data path. So the five classic components, we have input, we have the data path and control, together they form a processor. We have the memory and then we have the output. Right? Input, data path, control, out, memory and output. In new systems, these are the classical components of a computer system. The interface, the compiler, anything that goes above that theoretically is not a part of the computer system. Right, it's just a translator, right? The compiler is not considered as a part of the computer system, right? Okay, so with this information, let's, let's talk about uh, the computer operation itself and how it works. So a lot of computers that we have today are uh, based on the von Neumann architecture. A little, bit, a little bit of history. So von Neumann was a scientist, a computer scientist, that was working on um, emulating brain a few decades ago. They were talking about 50, 60 years ago. And his idea of how brain works was that we have a memory part and then we have a processing unit. And data goes from memory to CPU to this processing unit and now we call CPU. And there is a way to communicate. This processing unit asks for a data. Somehow we send the data to this processing unit and it does some computation, and that's how brain works. He's one of the biggest names in the computer architecture, but he couldn't be more wrong about the brain itself, right? So this had nothing to do with neuroscience. The lack of knowledge at the time now we are still working on computing, designing computer architectures that work based on the brain. It's actually one of the biggest parts of my lab. And I teach a course called Neuromorphic Computing, which is about how to design computer architectures and programs that actually work like a brain. Probably 50 years from now, people are gonna laugh at us because we think this is how brain works. Same way that we are actually thinking about how one human architecture is emulating brain, right? We have a little bit more information, but we are not even close to understanding how actually brain works, but we're doing our best. 
So if you're interested to know about this, there's an oromorphic computing course, a lot of that advertisement next semester that I teach, you can take that course. Um, but von Neumann was trying to figure out how the brain works. And this is what he designed. It's called von Neumann architecture. Now we're working on beyond von Neumann architecture, for example. This guy is so big that we just, even if we want to work on other computer architecture, we say beyond von Neumann architecture. So what is a von Neumann architecture? It has a processing unit, as I said, and it has a memory, right? These days, they're mostly located on the board. They can be in the same package, too. It depends on your uh, memory hierarchy. We're going to discuss this in details probably in a month or two months from now. But for now, just take it. We have a CPU, we have a memory. And CPU, a very basic CPU, not a CPU that is advanced enough to have multiple threads. We're not talking about those kind of CPUs. Uh, they execute one assembly instruction at a time. One instruction at a time. To get the data from memory, CPU sends a request to the memory and says, I need that data from that address. And memory sends it back, right? And then now this data exists in the processor and they can do some computation with that, right? When it is over, if it needs to be stored back in the memory, again, the CPU sends a new address and put the data on the data bus and send it to the memory. So the data keeps going back and forth between CPU and memory, right? Okay, so this is the big picture of how a processor and memory work. The processor does the computation, memory deals with data, they go back and forth, and the computation is done. This is exactly where the bottleneck is in today's, for example, machine learning architectures. When we have a data intensive application, we have to keep going back and forth between processor. And this thing that seems to be very small is actually the bottleneck. That's where the entire idea of, for example, some topics like in memory computing architectures come to the picture. Again, my lab also works on in memory computing architecture. We are actually known for in-memory computing architecture that could be in YouTube. That's another topic. This is where you do the computation where data exists, right? Okay, so now, with this knowledge, uh, we want to execute a very simple program. It gets three integer values that are stored in memory, and it just want to get the average of these three values. Basically, add them, and you divide it by three, right? We want to see how it works and how this computer abstraction that has a memory and processor work to finish this such program. Now, going back to the simple computer abstraction, we have a processor, as you can see here, that crunches bits, processes the bits that it receives from the memory, and that's where the, the bits are stored. What are the bits? Bits are the value that it can be the address values, or it can be the actual the content that we have at the memory. So we're gonna talk about it in the next slides too. Okay, something to keep in mind is that the communication between processor and memory happens through two different buses. One is address bus, as you can see here, and the other one is a data bus. Address bus is a unidirectional connection, because you just send the address to the memory, from memory, from processor to memory. So you always send this address to the memory. It doesn't matter if you want to read something to the memory, so from the memory, or start something to it, you send the address from processor to memory. So it's a unidirectional connection. Then we have a bi-directional connection, which is the data bus, as you can see here. And that's bi-directional because you want to either store something in the memory or read something from it, right? These are the two important buses that you use to communicate with the processor and memory. Now, for this simple code that you can see here, C code, one line, we add A, B, and C, and divide by three, we need seven 
instructions in assembly. The first instruction is we read the data from address 512. Right? So operands are underlined, as you can see here, and the operations are in bold. So operation here is reading. We're reading something from the memory, and the address is 512. So we don't worry about where the address is coming from now. Assume that we know it somehow in help. It's 512. So we read the value for A, and then in the next instruction, we read the second value for B, which is stored in address 513, right? And then we add those two values. At this point, we don't want to store anything back because we still have another add to do. So we read the third value, we add them again, and then we divide it by three and store it back the memory address 600, which is where we want the average integer to be stored, right? So seven instructions for that one line of code. This is usually the case for assembly. So a very simple line of code in C is going to be converted to many lines in assembly. Why? Because we have simple instructions, right? We can't deal with adding three, four values at the same time. We have to read this, store it, read it, add it, read the next one. So you have to go back and forth between process and memory for a case like this, right? This is what is called assembly language. This is this can be assembly language program. program. This is actually your, if you haven't worked on assembly language before, this is actually the first program that we have in this course, right? So instructions are actually, actually very similar too. It's very basic, the instructions that we use in assembly. So now, with having that in mind, we want to go step by step and see how it works, where the data is stored, and so on. The very first step is initial conditions. These are the things that we believe that is coming from somewhere. You don't have to be worried about it. But actually, when you're running your code, you have to have this initial values stored in the memory. Because at the beginning, you don't have anything in the memory. So this can be either you move this data to the memory in the beginning of your code, or this addition can be somewhere in the middle of your code, and you already have this data stored previously before getting to this part of the code, right? But for now, we just say we want to initialize it. We want to move those values to different blocks in the memory. So this is the memory that we have here. And the initial conditions, the process is not doing much. We're moving, let's assume that the A is equal to one. So the number one is moved to address 512. And B is equal to, equal to two, we have value two is stored in address 513, as you can see here, and the value three, which is for C, is stored in address 514, right? These values are stored in memory somehow, right? So, as you can see here, each address has a numbered label. So this 513 is literally the address that we can use. Something that you have to keep in mind is that we don't have 513 in a computer system. We have the binary value for that, right? These are just for us to better understand how it is. The decimal numbers that you can see here is for our understanding, but it's literally a binary value for 513 here. Only ones and zeros. Then we have storage cells. So for example, this C equal three is stored in this block. And the numbered labels are these addresses that we can see here, 514, right? The number label, story cell, right? As simple as that. And initially, you move this data to the memory down. Now, we go to the first step. A very important register in a processor is program counter. So we have something called program counter, as you can see here, PC. And we're going to hear about it more and more when we go to actual computer design. The program counter is always pointing at the next instruction. This is important because it can get confusing in the future when we talk about the processor. So the program counter is pointing to the next instruction. So if I'm executing something now, the PC is pointing to the next instruction that should be executed. 
all these instructions are stored in a place called instruction memory. So program counter is pretty much the address for different blocks in the instruction memory, right? So when I was initializing my memory, the program counter was pointing to the first instruction. Now I want to execute the first instruction. The first instruction says, read data from memory address 512. So what happens here is that processor sends address 512 in binary, right? So this is address, don't have to, this is 512. So the binary value for 512 is sent to the memory. And here we're assuming that we have 16 bits for the data boss and 16 bits for the address boss. That can change. Right, different depending on the processor, we can have different number of bits for the data box and address box. So the address 512 is sent to the memory. And because the instruction is read, we're somehow telling the memory that we need to get something from here. We don't want to store something to the memory. We need to get the data. And the memory knows, okay, I have to send something back. What it does, it goes to the address 512 and send whatever is stored in 512, which in this case is one, to the processor. The next thing that happens when we are reading the data is adding PC, program counter, such that it points to the next instruction. So this happens at the same time. While I'm executing this read operation, I also increment PC so that I go to the next instruction in the next step, right? So now I go to the next step. PC is already pointing to the second instruction, pointing at the second instruction. Um, same story here. You send the address 513. Something that you have to remember is that this one is stored in the processor, which means I have some kind of memory in the processor. Right? Do any of you know what that small memory in the processor is called? It's closed, but it's not. It's what? Register. It's register file. So cache is also, we talk about the cache, but it was closed. Yes, cache is not the main memory, but it's still not inside the processor. It's part of the memory hierarchy. But then we have register file, which is a very fast processor, this is a memory. And it's so expensive that it's not worth having millions of them in memory but it is worth having tens of them in a processor, right? And we literally have something around less than 1K, 2K of them in a processor. In the MIPS processor, we just have 32 of them, right, for integer. So it's very small, very fast, and it's very temporary. You just put the data and you keep have replacing it with something else. So this one that I brought from the memory is stored in the register file, and it's here in the processor, so you can see it's here. Now the second value, which is 2, that is coming from address 513, will be in the processor 2. So now I have 1 and 2, and right here processor does the execution. The first, so far we were just moving data from memory to the processor. Now we will have to add this. It means that we are activating the adder in the arithmetic and logic unit, and we send this two data points, the values that we got from memory, and we want to do the addition. Now, we do the addition. In this case, we don't want to send the data back to the memory. So where do we store it? Register file, right? So we have one plus two, it's three, but we don't want to store anything back because we're not done with the computation. And a, a very bad, okay, that's the thing. A bad programming is sending it back to memory, right? You can, you, then you add, not only you add more instructions because you have one store board, but also you're consuming a lot of energy, power, latency to send the data back while you could use that small memory inside the processor, which is called register file. So, so you, this, how do you know this is not the end of the operation? How do I know what? This is not the end of the operation. Now we know it because this, it's an average calculation. So if you go to this program, it's A plus B plus 3 divided by Sorry, A plus B plus C divided by 3, right? And it's going to be stored in average. What we want to return, or what we want to calculate, here we don't even say return average, but we just want to return the average value. 
So you look at the, the, the correct way was if you just return the average, you could see that that's the only thing that we want to save. You don't even, in this case, we already said that we want to store average back, but in your program, if you're not even returning average back, don't go to the memory. But the idea here only is here is that you only move something that needs to be stored in the memory to the memory. Otherwise, use the register files, right? So in this case, we know that we just want to store average back because it's what is asked in the question, right? Store average back to 600. That's what it said. So we do one plus two. Now the value that we have in the register file is three. Now we want to read C. C is in address 514. We send the address 514 to the memory. We get the data back from the thing that is stored in address 514, which is 3. And now 3 is going to be in the memory. Here we do the next operation, which is 3 plus 3 equals 6, right? So this is simple. Now this is a tricky part. I don't have this description here for us to have some discussion. So we have the result of add, and now we want to divide it by a number. So where is that number coming from? The answer is already there, which is a little bit strange. It is coming from the instruction itself. So when we want to do, this is what is called I-type instructions. So we're going to talk about these two. We're going to have R-type instructions, J-type instructions, I-type instructions. I-type instructions are the type of instructions that has it work with a specific value, not a register. So it's like 3 divided by 3 divided by 4 divided by 5. And that, that is a number. It's called immediate. So if I said add immediate, it means that I'm adding something with a number. right? But that number is part of the machine code. So when I said divide by 3, a part of that machine code has that 3. Why is it useful? Why do I put it as a part of the machine code? Can you guess? So you don't have to go back to memory. Because we don't want to go back to the memory. If you have, otherwise, we have to store 3 in the memory. So that's one instruction and the initial step. Second is that now I have to go to the memory and bring 3 to. But that's just a number. So if I have a clever way of coding my instructions, those binary values, if this is, this is the beauty of the instructions of the architecture, right? A bad instructions of the architecture doesn't predict this problem, right? They just say, okay, go to the memory. But how many times do you want to go to the memory? Just for example, simple, that you want to divide by three or whatever. So you put that as a part of the instruction. So in, when, I, when I ask you to do encoding later in the class, when you see I type instructions, you know that, okay, this three, this number, is gonna go to this place in the instruction. And when I'm reading the instruction as a processor to execute this kind of instruction, I go to that part, that 16 bit, and read that value, that immediate value, and use it instead of going to the memory. Any questions? Okay, so now, go ahead. So these, these are just like a, like a constant and it's it's in the instruction memory. What what how many like how big of a number could you do? That's that's a beautiful question. So depending, I can give you the answer for MIPS, for yeah. example. So I type instructions have uh, sixteen bits on the right side of the instruction. So we're going ahead of ourselves, but that's that's fun because we're going to learn it. We're going to remember today, right? So this sixteen bits on the right side of the instruction. We have thirty-two bit instructions it's going to be that constant value, right? But this is also a signed value, so it can be both negative and positive, right? So pretty much it means when it's signed, this first bit is going to be just reserved for sign. You have another 15 bits, right? So when you have 15 bits, what's the largest number you can show with 15 bits? Do you know that? If I have two bits, the largest number is, we have an echo? 2 power 15 minus 1. That's right. So we're going to have 2 to the 15 minus 1. Right? This is the largest number, largest positive number, we can show with 15 bits. So the constant values can only be between a negative value. And what is a negative value? It's a range, right? This is the 
largest positive number that we can get? What is the largest negative number that we can get? Two to the minus two to the fifteen. Fifteen, right? So minus two to the fifteen is the is it largest negative? Or you say smallest, small. small. smallest negative? So, but this is this is. You know the point, right? This is the largest negative or the smallest negative number you can get, and this is the largest positive value you can get. But if I had 8 bits here, then it wouldn't support very large numbers. It was 2 to the 8 minus 1, which is 127. Uh, yeah. uh, all right, so that was a good question, but that's a part of the instructions. In the instruction. Now, we have the calculation done. We want to store something to the memory. We send it to the process to the memory. We send this address to the memory. And then we also send the data. This time, data is coming from processor, not from memory. I put the address, so address 600. And the data that I have at the end of all this computation is 2. So now I put 2 in here and send it to the memory. Right? I'm done. Seven instruction for good. Now, this is summarizing everything. You can take a look at this slide before. We already, we already covered it. All right, now, first question. Are well, you going to have a quiz sometime soon? This module is going to end probably as soon as next session. So this can be a possible question that you get. We have, let's say you work at Netgear, right? And they have wireless security cameras and they're using MIPS processor to perform motion detection. And the processor executes an assembly language program that, uh, on that average three pixels to detect movement, right? It's not a field work, we're just making things up, right? Average three pixels to see if there's a movement or not. So the goal of the design is find the fastest hardware fastest computer system within a $20 budget. So we have a $20 budget and we want to see what is the fastest computer system we can get. We have four options here, two different MIPS processor, MIPS 34K CPU and MIPS 74K CPU. The ex execution time for MIPS 34K is 2 nanoseconds, for the other one is 1 nanosecond and it costs $5 and $15, right? Same story for memory. We have a Toshiba DDR3-800 memory, and then we have a DDR3-1333. Uh, the read and write time for the first one is 10 nanosecond, but the other one is 6 nanosecond. So if we have, if we oversimplify everything, the goal here is that, now let's go back to this. give you part of the answer, but that was obvious. So obviously, this is not a combination. Two and four is over budget, right? We just want to have it within the $20 budget. So we really have three options. We have one and four, we have two and three, and we have one and three within $20 budget, right? What is the instruction? This is it. We have seven instructions that we just talked about. We have two reads, actually three reads, one write, two add, and one divide, right? We are oversimplifying everything. Can you tell me what is the fastest design? One. Oh. Okay, so let's walk and let's do it step by step. How many processor instructions do I have here? Seven. Seven. Seven? Is seven right? Do I have seven processor instructions here? Who says seven is correct? You can have an opinion. Seven is right or not? Raise your hand. Who says we have four here? Do we have four or seven? Or three or seven? Do we have three? So who says three is right? Seven is right. Because for every instruction, we need to use processor. If you remember processor, finds the address, sends the address, the processor is involved in every processor. How many memory instructions do I have here? Four. four. We just have four. So we have seven processor instructions, four memory instructions. 
So if you do the math here, combination one and three, we have seven process instructions and multiply it by two, and we have four multiplied by 10. This gives us 454 nanoseconds. This is, I emphasize, this is oversimplifying everything, but at this point, we're talking about design abstraction, and it says the abstraction, so don't worry about it. Then we have combination of one and four, we get <coughs> seven processor instructions, two nanosecond plus four memory instructions multiplied by six nanosecond, which is delay for the memory. Right? Seven instructions multiplied by two, which is delay for the CPU, plus four instructions on the memory multiplied by six nanoseconds, because that's how long it takes for the memory number four to do it, for the DDR3-1333. And then we have combination two and three. We have seven processor instructions. It takes one nanosecond for this processor to complete the task, plus four memory instructions, and it takes 10 nanoseconds for the, this memory to complete its task. So four multiplied by 10, and we get 47 nanoseconds. So the fastest one within this budget is one and four, which takes 38 nanoseconds. Right. Any questions? Okay. Now let's go to the second question. So we have a computer system that is single core. It has a single core 32-bit processor and has 8 gigabyte of byte addressable memory. So what is the minimum number of wires on the data bus between processor and number? 32-bit processor, 8 gigabyte of byte addressable memory. You say each of these guys are one byte, and 8 gig of them. So one kilobyte is two to the 10. One megabyte is two to the 20 bytes. And one gigabyte is two to the 30 bytes, right? So we have eight gigabytes of memory and we can have access to each byte. Eight gigabyte byte addressable memory. And we have a 32-bit processor. So what is the minimum number of wires? So what it means is that how many bits? The minimum number of wires, we need one wire for each bit. So really the question is asking how many bits does the data bus have? Eight. It says eight for data bus. So let's just give the answer, eight. What else? I heard 30 something too. Two to 30. The 30 and multiplication of 10 and multiply by 2 to eight. the oh, no. multiply 3. By eight. Yes, yes. Yeah, so we're going to have 2 to the 33 wires. That's one answer. Anything else? 30. 30 itself. We have 30. What else? 33. 33. Okay. What else? We have four options here. Let's vote. Who says eight is right? For the first question. Someone second. said. Someone said eight. For the first question. The data loss. Eight. You said it's eight. We have two to the thirty-three, and we're talking about data loss. We have thirty, and we have thirty-three. We can vote, and we have none of the above. I actually want you guys to raise your hand. So, eight, one, we have two to the 33, one, we have 30, two, we have 33, one over there, none. Okay, so if it's none, then what is the right answer? 32. 32, because that's how many bits the processor has? Yes. So the, the right answer is 32, because it's a 32-bit processor, and that's what defines a data bus, right? 
So we have 32 wires because we have a 32-bit processor, and this is exactly what a 64-bit processor is too. What is a 16-bit processor? It means that we can, in one cycle, in one clock, we can send 16 bits of data. We can send 32 bits of data. 32 bits. How about the address bus? So those who were overthinking it were kind of close for address bus. 33. So we have so these two can potentially be the right answer. What do you think? Who says 2 to the 33? Who says 33? 33 is the right answer. So you have that many memory blocks, right? So if I have two memory blocks, but just one bit, I can address both, right? If it's zero, it's this one, if it's one, it's here, right? If I have four memory blocks, but just two bits, I can address all of them. This is zero, zero, this is zero, one, one, zero, and one, one, right? So you, get to the, you have to get the log two of the number of bytes that you have in your memory to get the number of wires, the number of bits that you need for the address boss, right? Is that clear?